why look at this topic? Um, it's why, why all religion, a really convoluted title. Um, but why, why take it? Because it's what was given to me by another ecclesia. And they said, please, could I talk on this subject? But it really made me think. Because instead of looking at the subject, and there's a leaflet at the back that says one, it's says, why all? Why do all religions don't say the same thing? So it made me sit, sit and think and actually take a global view. Why have we got all these religions? Why are we here? Am I in the right place? I, I went to five different churches before I part the Christadelphians. Am I still at the right place? Is there somewhere else? that It, it says in Corinthians, it says, we will see through the glasses through dark, yet darkly. And all of us have our own preconceptions at the start, which we take into what we're looking at. I've tried very much to take this as a purely analytical approach and looking at all religions. Let's look at them. Let's find the trends. Let's find the commonalities. Let's find out what's going on with those religions and get to some conclusions together about why do all religions not say the same thing? Why is there so much difference? I, is it important? I, for example, I was trolling around and you, I found out there was a website called Religious Tolerance and it sort of sums the situation up to a certain extent. What is our eventual condition after we die? Do we eventually land up in heaven, hell, purgatory? Are we sent to one of those locations immediately? Do we simply disappear and cease to exist in any form? Do we sleep for a long time after death before waking up for final judgment? Are we reincarnated into new bodies, either as animals or humans, for another lifetime on earth? Within Judaism and Christianity, different traditions, faith groups, writers over the past thousand years have proposed a variety of scenarios covering above options and more. All have based their, bi their beliefs and interpretations on the Bible, generally speaking. Roman Catholic Church based its belief on heaven, purgatory and hell on some main biblical passages in Hebrew and Christian scriptures and the 14 books of the Apocrypha, supplemented by church wisdom and teaching down through the centuries. It then moves down through liberal Christians, humans, atheists, agnostics, and it just finishes by saying, most follow of other religions also follow their teachings of their faith tradition. This satisfies the main requirement that many people of their religion to give them a sense of security in the face of an uncertain and frightening world and the inevitability of their personal death. That's, that's a statement without hope. Basically, it's saying people are looking where there is no hope. And I believe it's important to have a hope. So I want to try and find the faith that gives a hope, that gives me some personal satisfaction. And that's what I'm, I'm sharing tonight. It's purely my own thoughts. It's purely what I've been going through. Inevitably, I've done a lot of looking, and it's going to be summarized down to conclusions, which I'll gladly show you the materials afterwards. So enough of the long introduction. We're going to go through this in three parts. Part one is because I'm conscious a few of you weren't here the first time. It's a bit of a recap, quite a long recap on the first talk. Then we'll go into the body of the second talk, and then we'll have a conclusion. Um, the reason why, it's it was just so big. So the first talk, we looked at origins. And we looked at origins of where did all this religion come from? Um, and tonight, the second part of it, will then look at the endings. And it will look in particular at what about afterlife? What about looking at um, the, the end of all things, Armageddon, whatever it's called? What do, what do different people believe about that? And then I sat back and looked and said, well, what does that end up with criteria? That can you, does it group? Does it come together? What are the conclusions? And I've ended up with three or four different questions that if you answer those between this and this, it actually separates all religions into these areas. So, so that's, that's the theme that we're going to go through tonight. Yeah, it is warm. I'm basting already, so I'm going to be drinking a lot of this as we go. So... This was the um, rough, rough theme that I was looking to take the last time, which was going through major religions, the origins, the view of a creator. I had to take out view of the future, commonality, differences. We then looked at the uh, Babel Pangaea, it's called, and Yahweh's message was the thing we did the last time. So let's skim through what we did last time again. This comes from the Lion Handbook. Is there any chance we could kill these two lights? Because that would make me a bit uh, cooler. Thank you. This comes from the Lion Handbook and is quite a good, I looked at a lot of places, quite a book way of summarizing where a lot of the, um, where a lot of faiths came from. And you can see from a very small point of three, then you've got a lot of faiths all come from the point of three. So let's look at, up at that end a little bit more and finding out from the research that what you've got is you've got 
most faiths are coming from th all faiths are coming from three early points if you're looking at origin either abraham so that's the faith of the israelites or you're talking about the hittites with the egyptians and the babylonians should also now i've looked further conclude the phrase the akkadians and the sumerians that's that general group together and then hinduism so from those three points all faiths tended to then come and branch from that as they're coming coming through and from that you then move through and we'll, you've got faith of the Persians coming through Zoroastrianism. That's the faith of the Medes and Persians for those you've got. Your Babylonians to the Medes and Persians. And then the Greeks that had its own faith, we know. And then, then we've got the faith of the Romans, very much based on the Greeks. Uh, and then from that you get newer faiths coming on board, like, for example, Sikhism coming in towards the end. And Baha'i. Um, Baha'i is like the replacement for Zoroastrianism. It's from Persia. And it's like almost uh, an eclectic collection of lots of thoughts from all around that uh, have been gathered together in one area. Okay, so the conclusions I've got so far was that the oldest religions are the religions of Yahweh, Hittite, and Hinduism. And I'm starting to use the word Yahweh. Now, as a non-Christadelphian, I came along Christadelphians and said, um, why are they changing the word Holy Ghost to Holy Spirit? And why are they changing the word sometimes God to Yahweh. Now, actually, as I've gone through this, I've now got a lot more respect about using the name Yahweh to describe God. Because when you look at the Bible, really, what's happening is, it's God's name. It's God saying to say, I am the God of the Bible, this is my name, and there are all these other gods over here. Because the gods of the Hittites, the gods of the Akkadians, the gods of the Sumerians, the gods of the Kenizzites, Perizzites, that was in verse 19, which we didn't read, the introductory reading. All of those they came from what's called polytheism. Basically, they decided to have lots and lots and lots of gods. We'll cover that in a little bit more in a moment. But basically, you look at the Old Testament and it's the battle between the God of one, monotheism, God against polytheism, people having many gods that they select. And Hinduism is also polytheism. I chose Hittite because the Akkadians and the Sumerians, they just generally had this, um, after people died, you went into a nothingness. It just sort of went into nowhere. And the Hittites, the first we've been able to find something around what they had as a faith. They had, a, it was known as the kingdom of the thousand gods. And this is where we start getting interesting, is that what happened is, the idea was, uh, and you can read this in loads of books now as well, is that if you beat their god, then obviously your god was better than their god, so therefore you could take their possessions and their god became subject to your gods. So slowly you started with one god and more and more and more and more as you basically conquered, conquered a tribe plus their god and then they came subsumed into your area. Okay. What I find fascinating is the Bible explains all this. The Bible throughout gives an answer to how this happens and explains all these religions and the histories behind all these religions. In that you started off with God doing, doing what he was setting down, a single path for people to follow. And then after God set down a single path for people to follow, we find in Genesis 6 it talks about sons of God, daughters of men. And you start finding that people start straying and you get this strain of thought which is basically i want to follow god or i'm going to follow man and the ways of man and that comes as early as genesis 6. you get this then thought coming from that at the time cain label laban all the people they are the people who produce those tribes the sumerians the Cadians, the hittites all of those produce the big tribes that are around at the time of abraham but sorry it, they set the trend for the thoughts you then get the time in which um, Babel causes then the splitting of the nations and from Shem, Ham and Japheth we'll look at and we'll find how then again faiths split and I've got a suggestion that you can see the logic of how things progressed but basically you can see that God's way is one of monotheism and his name is one I am that I am and that is the message that's been giving us from very much from the Old Testament consolidated in the New Whereas on the other side, you've got people choosing their way, their gods, because they wanted to interpret it their way, leading towards polytheism. And, well, why not let them leave God, leaving towards atheism? Okay, so that's one of the conclusions. 
Then we've got this thought of Pangaea to Bible, Bible to the continents, in which you'll find that when you start grouping them, I was able to identify that you can actually put the faiths that come into the three types that are here. You've either got monotheism coming from Shem, who was the son of who was the, fir who was the first son who followed God. You've then got Ham, who actually rebelled quite early, and he scattered away. And Ham seems to be, you find, the, the father of the tribal religions, which were very basic, um, very independent in which they were doing, very um, not actually having much thought of an afterlife comes as the trend. And Japheth, which was then actually beginning to say, well, actually, I'm either going to live my life uh, no hope, or I still want to have some hope, so therefore I'm going to be in this camp, which is the group that had an afterlife. So you ended up in these three areas. Monotheism, of which Judaism and Islam and are the main two areas that really have monotheistic base. And then you've got Ham, which follows marriage, a tribal base, and Japheth, which, from which we get the Greeks and the Norse and the Celtics and the, and the Hinduism coming all from this root. Does that make sense? Can you justify it? Well, this is where this bit about Pangaea comes in, is that it talks in the Bible about how the whole landmass was separated. Time of Peleg, I think it's called. And this is, this is one land mass. So you can take Eurasia up there, North America, Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica. If the whole earth was smashed together into one land source at the time of Babel, then after that, Ham scattered, Japheth scattered, Shem stayed very much in the Israel area there. And you end up that the land masses were very much occupied in this way. Now, if you take that and compare it to your faith chart that you've got, the one which is a, a line, you, you will find that nowadays there is still an alignment with this. So very much what happens is, is that Japheth was the home of all forms of um, polygamy with a belief in an afterlife. And that afterlife ended up being one of either reincarnation or of resurrection. Ham was very much the tribal face, the face that stayed very, very independent, I would suggest. What about the origin religion? What we also found is that there's no books, there's no books that talk about the origin of faith before 600 BC, which is the time of the Greeks. Everything before then is, tradi is oral tradition. Everything is claimed. Um, we won't go into that, but you can find that the Greeks are the first, therefore, we've got some solid foundation we can objectively look at, rather than it being word of mouth. The Bible is the only book that actually claims to have writings beforehand that can be written, written and viewed. Now, they can't all be viewed, but there's no evidence of any Hindu literature to look at. You can't find anything of that. And they say it was all oral until about 200 BC. So they don't claim to have anything written. The Bible is the only book that claims to have a written thing to, to be followed because it says these are the words of Adam, these are the words of Moses, these are the words. Now, interestingly, when you then go back and find 600 BC, you find that shards of, of um, pottery have been found that have been dated back to 1000 BC, which have got Hebrew writing on them. So we know that Hebrews could write, uh, we know that they could write at least 400 years before this. So this is, the, this is a claim. The claim is that the Bible is the earliest literature to look at to try and find the truth. A claim you can test or challenge as you wish. One, one of the things that comes from this polytheism, by the way, you can see here that that's three gods, three gods together, united coming from Hindu, and you then go to, um, to, to the Greeks at the same time you've got these, You've got Persians were the three. A lot of the faiths come out with, and that includes Babylonian, come up with this idea of three gods being the power and equality between the three gods together with one slightly more powerful. And so the thought of, and that's why I'm trying to summarize, the thought in the Trinity of being a polytheism because it's putting three gods in one. Okay, so mainstream Christianity ends up as a, an assimilation of um, Eastern Trinitarian polytheism, tribal, which we get things like Sunday, Odin's Day coming from, and oral traditions coming out, particularly in Judaism in there, with human derivatives coming from it, like atheism, evolution, Scientology, nihilism, and we can keep on going. 
These are the big faiths um, in terms of number of people um, believing at this moment in time. So you can see Buddhism very large, Christianity largest, Islam coming through. Interesting, I thought Epicureanism? Isn't an Epicure something to, to eat? Well, Epicurism, strangely, comes from a chap called Epirus. Epirus was a Greek person, and he talked about that all you needed to worry about was food and drink. The origin, food and drink, the origin of hedonism, actually comes from Epicureanism. So this is where it comes back, before the time of Christ. Largest religions on the left-hand side, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Judaism. You can see coming through as the large numbers. And the distribution. Interestingly, the, the gods of Japheth very much reduced down. Polytheism reduced as, as Constantine, as Rome came through with you know, the influence of a single faith, then the, then the thoughts of the Norse and the Greek gods very much reduced down. But you can see how Christianity has then conquered <coughs> large areas. Islam, very a central band, very much central band with very little penetration to the extremes. Sort of very much showing for me how that was Ishmael and the tribes of around Ishmael that slowly grew. Then you've got Buddhism and areas around like here. Around here, it is all very much really um, about self-actualization. It's about self and enhancement of self and moving self forward. Either Buddhism on a very, very highly moral ground, moving towards nirvana, moving towards something true enlightenment, or if you get into the West, this is where you've got Nietzsche and nihilism actually saying it all destroys into nothing. I'm sorry, time is really skipping on. So, I'm, I, will, I, will move, I will move on to there, but here's, you see, this is, comes from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. You can see, where do the earliest faiths come from? Judaism before Hinduism. So just evidence of the claim about where does the origin come from for you to accept, please. Right, let's do a quick grouping so we can try and spend the rest of the evening on faiths that you know and are interested in. What we've got is we've got four groups in which I decided is that you can split things into monotheistic polytheistic, heaven-going, polytheistic reincarnation, and atheistic type faiths. So let's, let's give you a break and get your brains working for a minute. Shout out faiths that you know, and we'll put them. If you can tell me which one you think it goes on as well, that's good. If not, we'll have a debate. I'm waiting. Sorry, Islam top right. Thank you. Christianity top right and also Christianity top left, depending if you're Trinitarian or non-Trinitarian. Yeah? More? Judaism. Judaism top right, thank you. Sikhism. Sikhism, what do you think? <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> I think. I think Sikhism is one of those, it's really interesting, Sikhism is one of those confusing ones because it comes so late that it's taken a monotheistic view, but it actually then still believes in reincarnation. So it sort of crosses the boundaries. Next. Buddhism. Buddhism. Buddhism is highly moralistic atheism, really. Very general. But it's talking, we'll look at it and we'll find, because Buddhism has no hope. It's talking about self-actualization and about coming through and getting to a state of self-enlightenment. So the focus on it is about self and self-awareness. And what you're getting is you're getting focus on self rather than focus on other beings. And so this becomes a grouping of people who are looking to self and how self can be satisfied. Yep. Hinduism, bottom right. Hinduism, bottom right, thank you. Yes? Humanism. Humanism down here. Are you happy with that, Malcolm? Yes. Thank you. Scientology. Scientology. Um, you know, they, they believe in, an, it, they, they debate themselves about the belief in a, you know, an intelligent design coming through. So could actually stray into that area. Anywhere else? 
Buddhism. Got Buddhism. Okay, good. So that's that's the grouping. If you didn't, uh, where's my gadget gone? In my pocket over here. If you uh, if you wanted to just check on on more. That's, that's about the top 30 faiths that are going through. Islam, we've covered Hinduism, Chinese, Buddhism, ethnics down in that area. This ethnic and African tends to, and the secular, very much ham. Sikhism, Yoika. Yoika, very big. That's the faith in Korea. That's the faith which comes from, I uh, forget the name of the chap, but it's all about work ethic. It's all about you will work and you will have a good life, which is basically serve me. Um, you know, no thoughts, no thoughts of a kingdom belong there. So Yoika comes down here, but huge faith when you take it. Spiritism, um, Judaism, we got Baha'i. We talked about Jainism and Shinto. Jainism comes from Hinduism. Shinto comes from Buddhism. Kaodai comes from again from Buddhism. Zoroastrianism, as I say, is the Persian one, which is here. And. Don't know Tenrico, didn't look beginning to get into shorter numbers that were going through. Okay. But basically, I'm saying religions fall into two types. Religions fell into two types about having a, a, mon a monotheism, a polytheism, and an atheism. And it really does spring to mind how Elijah then said to people, How long do you hold between two opinions? If Lord be God, follow him, but if it's been Baal, then follow him. And so there's this decision that people have to make, whether you're following the God of the Bible, Yahweh, as opposed to no God or the God that you have decided to create. Look at Judges. So really, the decisions about many religions when we look to origins is they come into two camps. Is that it's the polytheism comes from the decide to create your own God to give self-justification, and the God of the Bible is the two conflicts that we came out when we looked at the origins. Okay, moving on to the endings then. That's the grouping that I gather together about belief in God. Polytheism, heaven going, coming up here. Mainstream Christianity in the Norse. Atheism, the ones we've covered coming through here. Polytheism, Baha'i in that area. And the monotheistic faith. That's, that's the foundation. If we then start looking at beliefs in an afterlife, there's a bit of a shift. In that those that believe in resurrection on earth, you've got Judaism. Fundamental Christians, Christadelphians, Islamists are ones that came to mind as I started looking at that area. Those that believe in about a resurrection are followed by a kingdom on earth. And I put Judaism as the top because that's the oldest of those faiths. You've then also got those that believe resurrection to heaven, of which you've got Egyptian, Greek, Hittite, Norse, Trinitarian, Christianity. And I put Greek as the foundation to give you a marker because they were ones that oh, they've got the most literature around it. Egyptians are, you know, they're a little bit more um, closer to the Hittites, a bit vague in terms of where you end up when you go over the, over the waters to their kingdom, their, their kingdom of heaven. Reincarnation, Hinduism is by far the strongest in that area. And self-actualization, in which I've put the Sumerians and the Akkadians, they had no real thoughts. It was just being against God. Humanism, Yoika, Buddhism, and Baha'i who follow the new Persian, they're, they're actually millennialists. Okay, when you then look at uh, resurrection to heaven, interestingly that um, Islamists have take a slip over to this side because Islam actually um, says that what happens is, is that there will, people will be go to heaven and there will be a thousand years in which thousand years will be a thousand years of chaos and then then Christ will come at the end of a thousand years, not at the start. And, and this, though, to me, this is where I'm trying to get the trend. This follows the lines that we picked up before about how people followed the thoughts of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Is that you've got resurrection on earth is very much the faith of Judaism, very much that faith coming from Shem and following the line of Shem down. Self-actualization was very much the rebellion, came from Cain, and that went with the flood, and Ham, who basically set up its, I will believe my own thing and not bothered about a God. And Japheth is the one that set up in, I need to have this belief in some form of an afterlife. That's my opinion from the research I've done. So what about the afterlife? Um, it's not just me. It's this book, Religions of the Ancient Word, World, World very much says that the two conflicts went on in the times of the Old Testament between the Jews, which was all about the resurrection of the body, 
and the Greek, which is all about the immortality of the soul. And that was a big conflict going on in the Old Testament. And here's the piece that I've got to about the Hittites here, how the kings overcame gods on death and how they just stayed in this state of God was a God on earth. No, no heaven going for the uh, Akkadians, Sumerians and the Hittites, the very early faiths. Let's, let's move on then. And this is the slide that I wasn't sure you could read. I was trying to get you to come closer, but you still rebelled. Um, this, let's take it and just go through what people believe in the afterlife. And if we take the Hindu faith, I'll read it out because you won't be able to, you probably can't read it at the back. Hinduism believes in the rebirth and reincarnation of souls. The souls are immortal and imperishable. So this is part of the reason, the origin of this thought of the immortality of the soul comes from Hinduism at the left hand, at the side, and not the side of the Bible. A soul is part of jiva, the limited being. So it's limited, it's constrained. It's subject to the impurities of an attachment delusion and the laws of karma. Um, karma is basically, we'll come to that, is this thought about you will then move on to a next state. It is destined for you to move on because you are suffering for delusion and you will therefore die and you'll get to the next stage and the next stage. So eventually you go through this karma this way before you end up at Nirvana, which is the end. We'll, we'll summarize that again. Death is therefore not a great calamity, not at end at all, but a natural process in the existence of a jiva being as a separate entity, a resting period to which it recuperates, reassembles, adjusts, returns again to the earth, continue its journey. So until a soul is liberated, neither life nor life after are permanent. They're both part of a grand illusion because it's just an illusion of the life you're living in now. You either progress to a higher building or you go back to an, what's an animal, a lower building, being and then work through the cycle. I've got many friends who are Hindus. Death is a temporary cessation of physical activity, a necessary means of recycling the resources and energy, opportunity for that part, the jiva, to re-energize itself and to review its programs and policies and plan for the next phase. We'll, we'll skip a couple. When a person dies, his soul, along with some residual consciousness, leaves the body through an opening in the head, goes to another world and returns again after spending some time there. What happens after the soul leaves the body and before it reincarnates again is a great mystery about which we can form an idea after studying the scriptures. So no ideas in Hinduism about what goes beyond the afterlife. It's very vague, not too much concern. It's all just about self-actualization going forward and then it just becomes a great mystery. The reason I think it's worth doing this tonight is because we've got to talk to people about this. And therefore, whether you're doing this from an analytical point of view or you're looking at it from a faith point of view, the more you understand about who you're trying to talk to, at least we can find common ground. Nirvana. Nirvana is the end. It literally means blown out like a candle. And it's most commonly associated with Buddhism. It actually refers to this imperturbable, you know, I can't pronounce it, this, this staleness of mind after the fires of desire, aversion and delusion have finally been extinguished. So it's the moving of yourself through to greater degrees of self-awareness, including the thought, the importance of afterlife. And then it moves forward until you reach this great stillness. And when you reach that great stillness, then all is peace. That, that's why there's this great thought of meditation enabling you to lift and to be able to be in a state of stillness, a state of calm, calmness. So it is the breaking out of this cycle of birth, life and redeath. Nirvana is the ultimate in polytheistic thinking in, for Hindu and also Buddhism. And you can see from that, that how Buddhism came from Hinduism. Sikhism came from from Hinduism. They have taken it and they've adapted it. And, and for me, I want to go to the place to find the original God, the original message. This is too tight for you, I'm sorry, but this is what Islam says, and this is an is Why Islam website. And, and there's a quote here from the Quran. To the righteous soul will be said, O thou soul, in complete rest and satisfaction, come look to your Lord, well please yourself and well pleasing unto him. Enter you then among my devotees and enter you my heaven. In Islam, an individual's life after death and the hereafter is very clearly shaped by their per present life. Life after death begins with the resurrection of man, after which, and I can't read this myself any foot anymore, but what the theme it's getting to is very much saying that how you live your life now influences you into the hereafter. Don't worry about the hereafter. Live life now. Don't worry about fatalism. 
because how you live your life now, you will then be rewarded afterwards. So Islam is very much actually about saying, by what you do will move you into the state of the hereafter. And that's why I started thinking again, and you find these categories then end up saying that this area here, I need to move Islam over, are saying faith actually will get you to the next stage, the stage of, stage of a kingdom, where all of the others are actually based on works. All of the other faiths are actually saying you have to do, you have to achieve, you have to self-actualize, you have to. And it's your condition of getting to the next place is based upon your own efforts. Whereas the faith that's coming from here, the faith of the Bible, that is actually saying, man, you can't do it. Try as you might, but inside you, you have a sinful nature and you will fail and you need grace. And, and that, therefore, for me, becomes one of the great big things between faiths is are you actually really, really accepting grace because grace is the free gift from God. It is the free gift from God from those who follow him. doesn't mean to say you don't work. But are you looking for grace or are you saying, I will earn? And that, I think, is a very big dividing point between faiths for us to look at and to think about and to debate. On to the uh, apocalypse then. Let's just do a very quick sortie around the apocalypse before we wrap up. Judaism, and this isn't mine, this has come from beliefnet.com, so it's got 10 different faiths which we're going to rattle through in terms of saying what will happen. Judaism believes the exiles will be in gathered to Israel, the dead resurrected, and all human humanity will live in a redeemed world. Simple, logical, um, and that's what we adhere to here. Hinduism says the world will be ended by a, a prale, literally a destruction, an all-destroying flood. So Hinduism actually <coughs> is fatalistic, it just says it will end. Um, Hoppy, going to America, it's just uh, they believe the land will be covered with snakes, stone rivers, a giant serpent's web, the seas will turn black, huge blue star will crash into earth. So that, that's an example of the ham I keep talking about. Okay, that's, that's not typical, you'll find more like it, but it's very much just it will end, we don't know how. Christianity, according to certain Protestant denominations, the end will begin with the righteous being raptured, directly lifted out of their clothes, jobs, cars, etc. to heaven, there they will watch everyone left behind and undergo a thousand years of tribulation, the reign of Antichrist, and eventually the return of Jesus for the ultimate battle. Fascinating, because that's exactly what Islam believes as well. Fascinating. That those two things have come from the same point, which for me means it's come from somewhere where Constantine, back to that point, Constantinople, where there was that influence going both ways, the influence to the west, the influence to the east, the influence of Japheth spreading across the west and the east. Islam actually believes the end of the end of the end is a grand judgment for all during which believers are distinguished from infidels by producing more sweat, but are eventually given a sweet drink that abolishes thirst eternally. Oh, that was sarcasm. I, mean, I should have taken that out. Okay. Islam today, this is what Islam today says about this is what we believe in the apocalypse in the end. Um, there's quite a long bit which is saying it's, it's the fault of Catholicism that has actually put in place the West, actually saying that it's about the West versus the East. And then afterwards it then says, we as Muslims believe there will be a great battle in the region of greater Syria. The countries of Syria, Lebanon, Palestine and Jordan. It will be between Muslims and the Romans. The Muslims will emerge triumphant after a very harsh battle. This is what Muhammad has informed us. They arrange themselves in ranks. Leave the way open. Let us fight them. The Muslims will say, no, we will never leave the way open between you. They'll fight. A third of the army will flee. A third, third Allah will never forgive them because they give up. A third will be killed and the best of martyrs in Allah's esteem. A third will be victorious and they will never succumb to trial and they will be conquerors of Constantinople. Isn't this preoccupation with Rome and Constantinople interesting? I find it interesting. As they're busy distributing the spoils of war after handing their, cord, their swords by the olive tree, Satan will cry, the Antichrist has taken place among your family. They will then go forth through a false claim. When they reach Syria, he will then emerge. They will still be preparing themselves from battle, drawing up ranks. And when time of prayer is, Jesus, peace be on him, in the same way they say Muhammad, peace be on him, Jesus, peace be on him, the son of Mary will descend and lead them in prayer. When the enemy of Allah, Antichrist, sees him, he will dissolve just as salt dissolves away in water. If Jesus were not to confront him at all, even then he would dissolve away completely. 
but Allah will have him killed by him, his Jesus hand, and will show him the blood on his lance. However, we as Muslims are not supposed to look forward to it or pin our hopes on it. We are not taught in our religion to wait around. We are required to support our religion by knowledge, by striving, by to call others, by reforming. So now I've got a feeling and some the faith towards an Allah of Islam <coughs> towards the thousand years. I, I find this one, the Norse, quite interesting because this is a cataclysmic, all destroying end at the end. Norse, one of the very early faiths. What do you get in it? You get a Midgard serpent. So they, they actually have this ultimate evil. One of, the, uh, one of the parts of the evil is a great big serpent, echoes of Genesis. And what happens? There'll be a great big stars falling, echoes of going on with that other, one, other area. The oceans covering the earth, the flood covering a few faiths. See how they all coalesce? And then out of the chaos and death, you'll just get a new couple that will then start up into something else. And so the cycle continues. You can have these slides afterwards, anybody who'd like them. Um, Zoroastrianism, the earth will be just devoured by fire, the opposite end, after which sinners will be punished for three days, then forgiven. Um, Mayan said, well, it's all going to end in 2012. And Buddhism just says that, well, it'll, it'll vanish, just a new Buddha will come along. So just very much a, 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 a mental experience. And Mormonism believes that Jesus Christ will come to Jackson County, Missouri, where humans will be assigned to three heavenly kingdoms. So that, that's, that's a skip through. Ends up into, I like my two by twos. It ends up very much in this area. There's those that believe in a millennial chaos, um, Islam being along that, not much rapturism, people who then believe that we will be taken to the heaven for a thousand years and then earth will be in chaos for a thousand years before the return to Christ as opposed to Christ will return at the beginning of the thousand years and establish a kingdom. Um, just the end, and it's in your mind. So body-mind, very much hammy type of, in your head, it doesn't, body doesn't matter very much. I need to be satisfied in my faith towards, well, it'd be nice if it progressed towards something more meaningful. And for me, the Bible was the only one that actually has a story of what goes on beyond this thousand years. It's the only one that actually has a co cogent and coherent picture that you can follow with your faith. So I ended up with, I'm sorry I'm talking fast, I ended up with, these are the, uh, the things that I started going through to try and get to segment the faiths. Am I on the right faith? Are you looking at the right things? Are you looking for monotheism versus polytheism? Be brutal, be honest, and look for it. It's the, it's the debate between the way of Yahweh and the way of man. S many, many faiths are actually founded by a guru, Guru Nanak, he was the head of the Sikhs. They're headed up by a person at the head, or there is no foundation for a belief other than a, a human entity, for example, Mormons. Do you believe in a spiritual or a physical kingdom? Do you believe that Christ will return and Christ will set up a kingdom? Or do you believe that it is something that is of a spiritual nature? Purely, we don't know, less tangible for me, less credible. Do you believe in faith and works? What are you going to put your reliance on? Are you going to go to a faith that says, actually, it's all about what you do now that will get you there? Don't worry. So long as you do it now... It doesn't, act, you know, you can kill yourself so long as you do it now with the right reasons. Or are you going to say, actually, I'm not in control. Who is my master? Who is my king? It's a huge battle in your mind between being a servant and actually saying, I want independence. Big, big question. And that really underpins the whole of this about saying, I, that word I, I want to come first and I am going to put in place a belief system which I want to follow or actually I am just part of a system and there is a great and mighty God who I wish to learn about. What about the purpose after the millennium? What is there? What is there in terms of the final picture? And I think if you ask those four questions, those are the ones that can help you go through this morass that we've been through of all the different faiths and you can segment them and you can have conversations around these areas. So if nothing else, so you can understand who you're talking to, what they believe.
So if you just take those four questions and ask them, it can help you then have debates about where you've got common ground and where we don't with people and other faiths. This purpose of the behind the millennium, though, so it's so key, is the whole point of the kingdom, the kingdom when Christ hands over, then the son will be subject to him, God, that Yahweh, that Yahweh may be all in all. And the point for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So the point of the God of the Bible, the point of Yahweh, is that if we are here to glorify him. It's this battle. It's this battle between man. It talks about you cannot serve both God and mammon. Are you going to serve yourself or are you going to say, I will trust a God and and who has created things. We have so much evidence to believe in God, so why don't we follow him? I think this is really cool. It's up on the wall there, just beside you. So it's the bit at the end. If you just read the bold words, the Bible message, Jesus Christ overcame sin. He was raised from the dead. At his return, he will bring peace and righteousness, ending suffering, injustice and war. That's the thousand years that many think will be chaos. And after that, the whole earth will be full of God's glory. So we have this message to go into a kingdom of Christ and beyond when you take the Bible that I've not been able to find in any other faith. Now, you might be able to find it, and I'd be love to have that discussion with you. But I don't see a faith that takes you beyond into something that has got a clear message that we can actually try to follow. That, that's my, my research anyway. So let's make it personal changing those questions into another way who are you really listening to who am i really really listening to are you listening to god or are you saying actually i will find my own faith i will find my own way you need to search your hearts and be honest because that will choose where you li live and where you put your heart where is your real home where are you looking? A huge amount of these faiths are about a tribal influence into an area and a land locked about the area where I could have possession. And do you really believe in grace or are you believing in works first? Those are the three questions. The Bible gives the answer. What does Yahweh require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? Micah. So many more passages we could go to. Where is your home? For our citizenship is in heaven, for which we eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have no abiding city. We are waiting for the return to be part of Christ's kingdom. Our home, actually, at the moment, is our heart is in heaven with Christ because we have no land of which we'll be part of, but we'll come back to land in a second. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, the free gift is eternal life, through in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ultimately, our works result in sin, result in death. But God, if we are willing to follow him, will, through his grace, will forgive us. So, God, through his words, has the answers if we're willing to listen to him. Who are you really listening to? Where is your real home? Do you really believe in grace? Two more minutes. Um, the reason we went to Genesis 15, it's about this name of God. It's a, it's a big topic in its own right, but if you take it, Abraham believed in God. We, if we won't go to Exodus 6 for time, but Abraham believed in God. Faith came first. God then counted it to him for righteousness. God saw grace. God gave grace to Abraham. Right back thousands of years before Christ was born, Abraham was forgiven his sins. The name of the God is absolutely critical. This is what the name of God is about. It's about faith. It's about grace. And then the result, he said, is I brought you out of the earth of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. So salvation comes. That's in Genesis. You'll find it in Exodus when you follow it through. The same thought, the same contract that God set with people when he uses his holy name, a covenant name we tend to call it, is that it follows this. If you have faith in me, you will have forgiveness and you, I will redeem you. I will redeem you and you will have an inheritance, which is the land. The name of God is tied to land. It is not tied to a heaven 
that was not there, but the point is that the earth will be full of the glory of God. His purpose with us is about him being with us on this land. And this land, not just Israel, not just one country or another, it's about God dwelling with us in this land. That is the ultimate purpose he is coming towards. That is his mighty name. He's saying, if you believe in me, you will be forgiven your sins and I will give you a parcel of land in my kingdom. Jamie referred to this this morning and it just it was so appropriate when I was thinking is that this is where people are at. People have got to search their hearts and actually, are you in this camp? Hearing you will hear and not understand. Are we filtering? Right back where I said at the start, are you filtering those messages in terms of you're hearing what you want to hear? You're seeing what you want to see because our hearts and our minds have gone dull. And, and that's the challenge we all need to make about where are we putting our thoughts? Because the ears are hired of hearing, the eyes they've closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and I should heal them. God is desperately waiting for us to listen to him and put him first. And if we listen to him, he has a promise that we will be redeemed and we will dwell in the land with him for his glory. Really, back to where I was before, it's a consistent, I looked at origins, I looked at endings, it's the same thing. Elijah came to the people and said, how long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if he be Baal, polytheism, atheism, follow them. Make your mind up. You cannot be in both camps. And we try, and we try. But the people answered him not a word because it bit. Uh, and that's, that's a reminder for all of us, I think, about our paths. And keep on challenging ourselves, who we're really listening to. Where is our real home? Where do we really believe in God's grace? I really would just like to finish with thinking then about the endings that have been promised us. Think of redemption, think of grace, think of faith, and think of God's promise to us through Isaiah 11. And I'll conclude there. Thank you. Reading then from Isaiah 11, verses 1 to 9. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity uh, for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the, mat, the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf shall, lie, shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaning child shall put his hand into the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea.